Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us here. Um, I'm Rafa from the marketing team at CMON, and today we're here with Michael Chanel, who is the co designer along with Eric Lang uh, of Bloodborne, the board game. Um, so, as you know, we'll be doing a short QA session with Michael. Um, please send your questions on our Facebook page using the hashtag Bloodborne, the board game. Okay? Um, also, one randomly selected participant who asks a question during this Q&A session will earn a free Blood Moon Pledge. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Um, and also feel free to hit uh, the like or the, hot, uh, the heart button. Comment where you're watching from. Let us know how excited you are about this game. Slam that little bell. Yeah, I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> right. OK, uh, let's get going. So Michael. Um, how much did you know about Bloodborne before getting involved in the development of the board game? So before actually getting to the project uh, Zero, I did not even own a PlayStation 4. Uh, that was actually a bunch of the research going in before designing the game was getting the game, playing through it, playing through it again and again and again, and making sure to know all the intricacies and everything of you know how it functions. Uh, all in all, in completion, I mean, I've beaten the game over like 13 times, basically. Every trick weapon got its own playthrough. The game stops getting harder, by the way, after your seventh new game. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, it's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long process, but still worth it. I mean, still one of my favorite games to go back and actually play. Yeah, cool. Um, and uh, do you? Uh, how deep do you feel it would be able to tell the story from from the game? So one of the things about the board game is that we are not looking to recreate the story of the game because the game already does that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the core game, we actually have four different campaigns. Each of them are featuring their own unique stories. There are elements that are taken from the games that would be familiar to people who have played the games, um, but also those just coming in fresh. You know, you're going to get a new pr story perspective here. Those mm -hmm. who have played the game, you're going to come into this and go like, "Oh, I know where this is going," and then all of a sudden we're going to surprise you because there'll be a little twist that you didn't expect to see coming. Right. Or maybe expand on some of the things that were kind of talked about in mm -hmm. the setting in the game mm -hmm. without it actually be fully uh, expanded upon. Mm -hmm. Both things are not trying to you know, reinvent the world or everything. We're being very careful about, you know, we're playing in someone else's setting, so yeah. we're being very cautious and careful about that. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so we took a few questions from our Facebook page from uh, people who sent them yesterday. Um, so, we are going to take live questions as well, so please. Um, send them to us, okay? Um, so, what was the most difficult part in creating the game? Uh, probably the transition about what elements of the video game to incorporate and what not to incorporate into the game. Because you know you can't just put every single thing in there. Nor mm -hmm. really should you, because otherwise, just play the video game. Yeah. The whole thing is that this needs to be a separate experience for fans of Bloodborne and fans of just board games in general. Mm -hmm. So, you know, creating the game like one for one, that's not something we're doing here. We're looking to create a Bloodborne experience. Yeah. And its own thing that you'd go, man, I feel like playing the game tonight. And then tomorrow like I feel like playing the board game and switch between those. One mm -hmm. shouldn't, you know, outdo the other. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, it's it's a game for Bloodborne Bloodborne fans, right? But how do you feel it is for newcomers as well? Um, like, will they get the feeling of the video game? Um, and uh, does the campaign represent the original video game uh, history? So, Bloodborne, above all else, is known for being one of the most difficult video games to release. Uh -huh. From software, that's like their entire mantra, is yeah. that the games are very hard, but fair. Yeah. And that's the feeling that you should get when we are playing the board game is uh, that's actually one of the reasons we went for the diceless element and to make sure everything felt, everything you do, every outcome is based on decisions that you make. So there's no random luck elements that are going to happen. Mm -hmm. So if you messed up, if something didn't go according to plan, it's because of a calculated risk that you took. Right. Uh, as far as fans of the video game, that's the element that hopefully that they will enjoy. Is mm -hmm. aside from just knowing the setting, knowing the characters and the bosses, um, that appreciation for this is how it's supposed to feel. Right. For the people that are just coming in, like, I don't know anything about Bloodborne, I'm just coming in here because the game seemed really neat and I don't want to spoil anything. The setting of Bloodborne is fantastic. It's actually one of my favorite video game settings just because the lore 
which it does make you earn, uh, is really deep. It's a good story, and the whole the Victorian Gothic aesthetic has been done a ton of times, but mm. Bloodborne has really made it something unique, and mm. it's, I really like it. And plus, the weapon designs, the enemy designs. I mean, I could talk this yeah, entire Q and A session about the cool things there, but I feel. The people that are just the board gamers coming in that have never played the video game, you're going to be in for a treat just discovering this world and the setting. Yeah. And also the minis, right? Yes, and the minis <laughs> are really great, too. Okay. So, question from Nick Arnold. Is it possible for one player to skill up more than one hunter or weapon set during a campaign? The trade-off could be between maxing one weapon or having two to three weapons with a couple tricks each. Okay, so when you Thanks, Nick. when you start a uh, campaign in Bloodborne, you're going each hunter is equipped with a specific trick weapon and firearm that they start with. This is going to be the hunter that you're going to persistently be playing through the campaign. There's no switching out trick weapons. Your hunter is basically defined by the weapon, which mm -hmm. is representative of the game because uh, as much as your the fashion sense, which outfits you're picking, can slightly matter. Mm -hmm. It's really all about the weapon you're picked. That's going to determine your play style. Right. Your stats after a certain point. Um, don't really matter, but that's an element that we have definitely included in the board game is how you level up your stats is going to change how your hunter plays mm -hmm. in combination with your trick weapon, which is going to kind of determine your play style. So you can play multiple hunters in the campaign if you're like a solo player and you want to play between one and four hunters you can, mm -hmm. but the game scales between just playing you know, one hunter by yourself up to four. Right. Yeah. And then also Nick, uh, Nick, Nick asked, is there a possibility of getting alternate, uh, alternate figure sorry. For the hunters with the weapon in their other configuration. So we have uh, on the trick weapon dashboards, it's actually in our update we did yesterday, was we are doing art on both sides to represent the weapons in their transformed state. As far mm -hmm. as miniatures of alternate things go, well, anything can happen during the campaign, but that's that would be spoilers. And we don't talk about spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> right. I will say that um, that is probably one of the most uh, iconic elements of Bloodborne is the fact that you have these really cool melee weapons that transform between two really cool forms. Uh -huh. And so we wanted to make sure that that was captured in not only the gameplay, but the graphics as well. And a bunch of people requested it. So, yeah. you know, we listened to these guys during the Kickstarter. Yeah. And that was something that we're doing is getting the, uh, the artwork on both sides. Right. Okay, next question. Babis Gialamas. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that right. Will, will we be able to experience plenty of endings besides the first four ones? That's a great question. I suppose he's asking there if the campaigns have multiple endings. Yeah. Okay, so as we've stated before, the core box has four different campaigns. We've uh, unlocked two extras during the Kickstarter. Uh, two, op sorry, three actually, two optional buys, and one in the, um, the structurals. So it's gonna be a total of seven campaigns. Now as far as if there are alternate endings at the end based on your choices and whatnot, that's going to devolve into spoiler territory, <laughs> and you're going to see for yourself. Because the thing is about this game that's unique is that you can fail your campaign. I mean, the campaigns are three chapters each. Each game session is going to be about an hour to hour and a half. So mm -hmm. playing through a full campaign is going to be like a one uh, kind of day or two day affair. You know, they're not meant to be these long stretched out things like you know weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah. Um, but your choice, your individual choices during those campaigns are going to affect later choices. Now, can that affect the overall ending? Well, again, we're getting to spoilers there, but that's definitely a factor that can come into play there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, next question. Um, Pele Manuel, how does the game, Chalice or Campaign, balance for different number of players? Yeah, so that ties into the question we asked earlier. Um, you can play the game between one and four hunters. The elements of the game scale off of the number of hunters present. So if you're playing one player to four players, the map is going to be substantially larger with four players. The objectives are going to be harder to achieve based on the number of hunters that are in play. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, that's that's just the numbers. So let's talk about the actual gameplay changes, because the game does change experiences from having one hunter to more hunters. Mm -hmm. The game is about a lot of resource and time <laughs> management, because death doesn't really matter a whole lot, because you're just going to go to the dream. Things might reset and you'll come back onto the map. Right. The biggest change between one and four players is how you manage your time and your resources with the hunt track. Uh, because while you have more players, you can spread out, you can accomplish more objectives, explore the map faster, but everything you're doing is taking up, you're having to split resources amongst that many more people. Yeah. If I'm playing one player, then I'm going to take my turn, the hunt track's going to advance, the game is going to progress a lot faster. 
if we have four players, the um, the hunt track is not going to advance as fast because it only happens in the round. So four players are going to take their turn, the track's going to advance, mm -hmm. versus one player takes their turn, the track advances. But the trade-off is that when players are going back and forth between the hunter's dream, that resource is now share, uh, shared amongst four players, yeah. and it is going to advance every time someone goes to the dream. Mm -hmm. So you can actually strategically use this to go like, okay, well, someone's in a bad situation. I might need to go and reset the map, or crap, he died, something bad happened, right. and now you just screwed over my progress here. Yeah. It's There's a lot of teamwork that needs to be played here because everything is a calculated risk. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to make those risks and deal with the repercussions if it's just you. Mm -hmm. But if you have a whole group that all of a sudden might suffer because of what someone is doing, you have to work together as a group uh, to decide, you know, okay, should we do this? Should I go back to the dream? Should we all go back to the dream? You know, there's a lot of group coordination. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. So Rudy Joseph Lockhart. Uh, my question is simple, but I'm still curious. Of the hunters that have been revealed so far, which one is your personal favorite and why? Fact. Of the ones that have been revealed is the trick there, because I'm actually in the camp that one of my favorite trick weapons in the game is the Logarius wheel which unfortunately lost our uh, vote that we put out. <laughs> I'm not going to say people chose wrong, right. but personally, that was one of my favorite weapons. Which, But other ones we have here, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Ludwig's Holy Blade. So in the core box, our uh, white church guard hunter with the Ludwig's Holy Blade is probably my favorite one uh, in the core box. Uh -huh. I've seen. As far as the ones we've unlocked so far, the uh, the Chicago Hunter that we just did in the chart set is also one of my favorite models as well. Okay. But I, I just got to go with the uh, Ludwig's Holy Holy Blade. Yeah, because I just like smashing. I love it too. Yep. Awesome. <clears throat> Next one. So random price. My question: What do you think is the biggest strength of Bloodborne, and what really sets it apart from the rest of the games out there? Uh, so one of the the elements I like going back to is that this game is hard. And it's not just hard because the math is against you. I spoke about this a little bit in some of the updates, but you can make a game hard by just increasing numbers and things like that. But mm -hmm. I really want this experience to be, if you look at the game, you can see there's a trail of decisions that led to every outcome that you came to. Mm -hmm. And it might have been a bad one for you, but you should be able to look back and go, okay, this was the decision that I made that started me on this very bad spiral of everything going wrong for me. Right. But then you're also gonna have those moments of, man, we did something so cool, like we didn't think we were gonna win, and then I did this play right here that canceled the enemy's attack, and then I dodged. You know, those little triumph moments to balance out the, the endpoints. Yeah. There's really those really big highs and lows, which to me is actually kind of like the uh, the endorphin rushes you get when you're playing Bloodborne, because you'll sit there and you'll play against the boss, and he'll beat you 20, 30 times. But that one time that you finally beat him, like the first time you beat the Orphan of Kos, or in my case, it was actually the Bloodstar Beast, which is now one of the simpler bosses I know uh -huh. how it works. Man, that guy gave me so many problems. Uh -huh. uh, and I remember the first time I beat him, it's just you get that moment of just, you know, you're not going to forget. And that's really what we want to recreate here is those moments of just like those rushes. Yeah. Of, I did it. I did it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was actually my next question to you. I was going to ask you, who's your favorite enemy? Um, yeah. uh, my favorite boss in the game, I, you know, this is almost like stereotypical because it's so many people's, but uh, but Viker Amelia is just so cool Like because she has just enough character developed. Her visual design is really nice. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, least favorite? Well, you know, they're all pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, there's some enemies that are frustrating for me. Right. Uh, the brain suckers, in particularly, because those guys have a habit of just stun locking me constantly, uh -huh. and I just I don't know. They're like a magnet. Uh -huh. It's just they have this move where they'll basically they'll stun you. Yeah. They run up, they grab you, they deal a ton of damage, and I'm just not good at dodging those. And I seem to just get hit every single time. And I remember one encounter where this one stun locked me four times yeah. and killed me outright. The problem is. They also drain resources anytime they do it. They're like one of the only enemies that do that. Uh -huh. So it was just frustrating. They're like, yeah. the worst possible one that happened just kept happening over yeah. and over again. Yeah. I think I can hear people <laughs> on the other side going like, me too, me too. <laughs> okay, next question. Scott Singleton. Are there plans to incorporate more than two enemy types per run? So every uh, chapter has two base enemies that are the enemies that show up around the map. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the only enemies that appear, though. 
uh, the, the scenario stories can spawn different enemies and in fact do that are special versions of it. So just because those are the two enemies that appear on the map, you know, a lot of people are following this format of like, oh, every chapter is going to be two enemies and a boss. Yeah. That's not actually the case. I mean, you might not even face a boss in some chapters, but you might have special enemies that show up. Um, okay, let's do some little minor spoilers here. Uh, in one of the chapters, the baseline enemies are huntsmen, minions, and hunter mobs. Uh, I know that there are some story elements that happen in that game where if you make certain outcomes happen, mm. you'll spawn uh, some scourge beasts that usually would not, you can play through that chapter and they will never, you'll never encounter them. Mm -hmm. But you'll play through them and make some decisions and all of a sudden there's some scourge beasts that pop up. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite elements actually is, this is an overarching campaign thing, but you'll meet a certain character at multiple points through the campaign. Uh, depending on your interactions during the end of game two or game three, you'll so you'll play through and they're like, oh, hey, you're an ally, here's some stuff. Or you'll encounter them, and if you haven't done the right choices mm. or certain other factors that go into play, they spawn as an enemy. Right. And so there's the dynamics there. They're not the main boss. They're not the priority of the chapter and everything. Yeah. They're just something that has spawned on the map because of decisions that you have made in the campaign. Mm. So yeah, basically the way to view that is that there's two set enemies per chapter, and then there's a little floating spot for random enemies and things that might appear. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Okay, keep the questions coming. Let's read the next one. Josh Chapman. Will there be a system for using campaign enemies in the Chalice dun Dungeons, or will you only be able to use Chalice-specific enemies? So all the core box enemies can be used in the Chalice Dungeon as well. Mm -hmm. um, the expansion enemies, we don't have plans right now to incorporate them into the chalice. And the opposite is definitely not true, because uh, each of the enemies that are used in each of the specific chapters, they're tied to the story of that chapter. They've got specific abilities that are linked to that chapter, the right. story elements of that chapter are linked to them. So it's not a matter of being able to plug and play those out, because they're, they're built into the story just as much as anything else. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you're going to have a story that's not really thematic. So it's like, oh, and then you know, we're going to break down this door, and there happens to be a giant spider inside this right. room. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Versus it's supposed to be a bunch of hunter mobs that are chasing down, you know, uh, survivors and things. Yeah, yeah. So, will PvP support... A, sorry, Brandon Price. Um, will PvP support a 2 versus 2 mode, much like the 2 versus 2 arena combat from Dark Souls? Um, so actually with the PvP mode, you can just do a free-for-all uh, fight mode, and then you can do teams. Mm -hmm. And, oh, we lost our image back there. Oh, well. Um, check out the Bloodborne Kickstarter. Links below. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're actually going to look to incorporating, um, well, not look to. There are covenant elements incorporated into the PvP mode. So the way some of that can work is that you will, you know, okay, this is going to be our team 2v2, however we're into it, but yeah. we are representing different covenants yeah. here to duke it out. Yeah. So that's another one of those little optional things that makes PvP just a little bit that much uh, more special if you're playing that mode. Right. So it's really fun, uh, but we'll have updates and everything, talk about that more throughout the campaign. Cool. Awesome. Uh, next question from Sergio Dima. Hello, Michael. Can you elaborate, please, on bosses? How they spawn, how hard it is to kill them, and what's the reward? <laughs> uh, okay, in order. The rewards are different based on each of the bosses. Uh, how do they spawn? They're going to spawn based on the story elements of the chapter that you're playing. Yep. Uh, that's specific to the campaign mode. They work a little different in chalices. Um, and how hard are they to kill? If you just try to bum rush a boss like immediately, which is a possibility, you just like, okay, we're not going to do any insight missions, we're not going to level our guys up, we're just going to speed run directly to the boss, that's choice. I do not see you having a positive outcome if you do that. Right. Uh, but it can be a challenge you know, mm -hmm. if you decide you want to do that. But you're going to need to come across the bosses. You are going to, the campaign, the campaign and the chapter are going to give you individual tools to try to help take them down. Yeah. Like, say we're up against the Cleric Beast. Okay, we go and we fight it. Man, that thing just really beat the crap out of us. Um, but we learned some stuff from it due to the insight system. Mm. So now we know that, okay, you know what? This is a beast enemy. It might be weak to fire. So we mm. need to load up on fire paper, molotovs. These are going to give us an edge. Yeah. So doing the insight missions are going to help you fight the boss. 
when I really feel that when you first come across the boss, you're gonna go like, how do we actually beat this thing? Uh-huh. And if you know, if you're if you're a badass and everything, <laughs> you might be able to like, yeah, we're gonna level one, just go and beat him down and yeah. try. Yeah. I don't see it happening, but you know what? People always surprise me constantly. Yeah. But okay. All right. Uh, Mike Corbett, how much of the blood game, uh, Bloodborne lore will be present in the board game? Sorry. Oh, lore? Absolutely, just like dripping as much as we can. Um, now, as we said back in the first question, we're not reinventing uh, the video game story here. Yep. We're being very careful because, you know, again, we're playing in someone else's setting. You know, I've, I've, <clears throat> when I worked on previous IP games for like A Song of Ice and Fire and um, anyone else's setting, it's very important to be respectful of the rules that they have set forth in their world yep. and not just make stuff up. Because that's like the worst thing you could do is you know change things around that's not respecting the original creator's intent or their vision of the world. Yeah. So we are trying to create new stories that do not impact the existing ones um, because again, there's a fantastic story already there that just merely add a little small bit of flavor to the overall world there. Right. With respects to this is what Bloodborne is, we should that needs to be maintained above everything else. Right. Right. Awesome. Okay, question from Brian Ferguson. Will there be enemies or situations outside of the Bloodborne video game that we can expect? Enemies? No. Uh, there's nothing, uh, as we just said, there's nothing original that we're making here as far as enemy designs go. Yeah. And in fact, all the hunters that we're making are, again, based on weapons and you know uh, the cool outfits in the game. Absolutely. We did a little bit of the dress-up thing there. Yeah. Um, so that's what you're going to see there. And as far as stories go, yes. Like the campaign one, we've got... One story which will sort of follow some of the events of the game. We've got another one set in Old Yardum that mm-hmm. fans of the video game will know. Uh, that was an area that was raised and burned to the ground by the hunters when it was deemed lost to the Beast Plague. Mm-hmm. Well, one of our campaigns is kind of taking place during that uh, during that little uh, event there. And actually, the first chapter of that is, you know, you're going down there to kind of evaluate how the Beast Plague is, and then yeah. maybe going, you know, we should probably set this place on fire. Yeah. So yeah. that becomes one of the main like campaign missions is doing that. Right. Right. Okay. Um, question from Marcus Cole. Gameplay wise, what is the difference between playing a campaign scenario, one game, versus playing a Chalice Dungeon? Story. Um, so Chalice Dungeons are just fun little, let's just go down, kill some enemies, get the full campaign experience in a single game. You're going to level up really fast. You're going to, the whole point of the Chalice Dungeons is you're going to basically try to find and kill the boss. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot, there's no story elements to it like in the chapters of the campaign. You're not mm-hmm. uncovering mysteries. Your job is to go down into a dungeon and kill stuff dead. Right. So it's a matter of finding the boss, finding access to the boss, and then finding out how to kill the boss. So mm-hmm. it's not just strictly cut and dry, like go from point A to point B and kill it, mm-hmm. but it's a much more condensed experience for those that really just like combat aspects of things mm-hmm. and just want to want a play session. Right. Versus the campaigns, which are the story that you're trying to uncover, the insights that you're trying to discover, and you know the multiple playthroughs to figure out everything that is actually going on. Because mm-hmm. you can play through a campaign, and you'll get a rough idea of what's happened by the end. Mm-hmm. But there's still going to be some story elements, some secrets and things that you didn't catch that first time on that playthrough. Mm-hmm. So if you play through it again, make different choices, go after different goals, you're going to eventually see the overarching full story. Mm-hmm. I feel that if you want to really get the full 100% story of that campaign. Like, okay, you know, like, we got this item, but it never did anything. Mm -hmm. And that's because you didn't do the story element that gets me on. Because you didn't find it, you didn't have time, whatever. But I really feel that it's going to take you a couple playthroughs for each campaign if you want to see everything that it has to offer. Uh And that's just from a, we've seen the story, we haven't seen this combination or these enemies and things like that. Cool. Right. Okay, we have a few more minutes. So, question from Lut Ferreira. Who was the most difficult boss to adapt to the board game, and why? The most difficult one was one that I can't really talk about. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, that's a non-answer. Um, <laughs> as far as the core box goes, so we've got Gazcoin, we have the Cleric Beast, we have Viker Amelia, and we've got the Bloodstar Beast, and actually some other surprises in there. Okay. That, you know, those are the bosses that you're familiar with from the game. That does not mean those are technically the only, what I would consider bosses mm-hmm. to show up. <laughs> so some of those little surprises are definitely ones. Um, as far as the one that I personally like, it's Gazcoin because mm-hmm. I feel that he's almost 
he's the barrier, like he's your, your skill test in the actual mm -hmm. video game. Mm -hmm. If you make it to him, then you could have kind of just been like hacking and slashing your way through, but the second you hit gas coin, that's your test to see if you understand the mechanics right. of the game. Uh -huh. And incorporating that into the board game, you know, he is going to test your ability to, you know, okay, time enemy attacks, to understand their behavior because he's got different forms that he's switching between depending on mm -hmm. his weapon loadout he's using. Mm -hmm. So if you come across him, it's almost like playing against a player who is just better than you. Mm -hmm. So you can watch him and go, like, man, these are the things I should be doing because look how much it's killing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Remember to use the uh, the hashtag blow the blood wound the board game. Sorry, Danny Fences. Are the miniatures D and D compatible size wise? I mean, everything's the twenty mm -hmm. millimeter uh, to the eye scale. Okay. Uh, twenty eight millimeter. Sorry, um, which is the same scale as you know our other games that we have out and whatnot. As okay. far as uh, D and D goes, I mean, I don't know the standard scale for the official D and D miniatures, but yeah. I mean. These aren't out of scale of anything else we've released or whatnot. Just noting that some of the bosses in Bloodborne are really massive uh -huh. uh, and scary. And most enemies are actually larger than the humans that are around because the, even the standard hunter mobs, the effects of the Beast Plague make them get bigger. So the enemies are by and by. They're not a bigger scale. They're actually just bigger in the game. Yep. So that's something to take into consideration. Yeah. They are some of the most fantastic miniatures, though. Right. Uh, that's, again, just talking about our own company. You know, we do good miniatures. I would hope we all agree on that. <laughs> and also, just the IP. It's such an amazing like art design yeah. on those. Yeah. OK. Um, Let Ferreira, again. Can you tell us more about the oversized double-sided tiles? Those are from the expansions. And basically, they are large locations uh, representative of the expansions that they are in. In the normal game, you have your small tiles, which are shuffled into your deck that you're going to discover. Those tiles will key off of the large ones. So for example, in the uh, Bergenworth campaign, uh, you're going to first off discover Bergenworth, and that mm -hmm. is represented by one of the large tiles. And they're double-sided, so they each have different elements that are used in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, the Murgo's Loft one, one of the main elements about Murgo's Loft, that campaign, is finding is Murgo, uh, and the Nightmare Frontier, sorry, the Nightmare Minsis is influencing Yarn. So the mm -hmm. first thing that's happening, that's why you're being called into the campaign, is so you need to discover what's all going on there and then find access to Murgo's Loft. Mm -hmm. And then so, for example, you might find a certain tile that says, okay, this is the access to exploring into this area. Mm -hmm. So that's going to then send you to the large tile that will do different things based on the chapter that you're playing. Right. And then the other side, for example, might be an arena where you're finding Murgo's Wet Nurse. Might be being it's probably the arena where you're finding Murgo's yeah. wet nurse. This large oversized arena where this boss has moving around, teleporting, creating shadows of itself. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we have time for a couple more questions. So, Sharon Kai Stutzer, sorry. Which aspect of this game is the most fun for you as an experienced game player? Um, definitely the trick weapon designs are my favorite because you can switch out your trick weapon. Uh, and it changes your entire play style. Like, I'm going to play through this campaign of a Hunter's Axe. Now I'm going to be more a little tanky and have AOE attacks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to switch this out for Ludwig's Holy Blade. Mm -hmm. And I've got this finesse longsword that just transforms into a giant greatsword and lets me, you know, slice things to death. Yeah. That, and then also seeing the different enemies and learning their behaviors. It's really rewarding when, you know, you calculate out, okay, this enemy's probably going to do this. This is how I'm going to counter it. And then when everything falls together, you get that moment of like, ha, gotcha! I'm smarter than you, board game. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Um, one more question, maybe? Let's see. Okay. Shifat Kanker. How short or long can a campaign be? Uh, how short can it be? As long as it can be as short as it, as, can be sh as short as it takes you to lose the very first chapter. Mm. Because there's no continues. If you don't complete the chapter, the campaign's done. Do not pass go, start from scratch. Right. Uh, how long can a campaign be? That's really going to depend on your play group because you might, if you're that group that like, you're going to sit there and discuss every single decision and then tell a bunch of jokes and you know, have fun and all that, then it could run, it can, you know, it can run long. Yeah. But again, a campaign, uh, a chapter will take you about an hour to an hour and a half three chapters per campaign. So again, you're really looking at like set an evening or a day along to do a full campaign uh -huh. or split into a two day affair. And again, everything is made so you can break it down after chapter, store everything and then pick right up with the next campaign yeah. or start chapter 
afterwards, you know, like if you play only once a month or something, yeah. you can refresh yourself really quickly, like, oh, this is what we all have. It's mm -hmm. very simple to break down and set up like that. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's going to be like an extended day affair or like a two-day affair to play through the full campaign. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, I guess it's time to wrap this up. But thanks, guys. Thank you very, very much. If you're not a backer of this project yet, the link is here on the comments. Um, and so make sure to, to check it out. Uh, the winner of the Blood Moon Pledge will be announced on our Facebook page. And um, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for more news, contests, inside scoops. And thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Um, and we're really excited about this game. We're sure you're going to love it. All right. We'll see you next time.